Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Dumbfounding Definitions, Dizzying Distinctions, and Diabolical Doctrines, a series sorting through some of the jargon of philosophy. In this video, we're going to be looking at what is civic humanism. Now, civic humanism is distinct from Renaissance humanism and modern humanism. It might be considered part of the Renaissance humanist movement as it revived classical ideas of civic participation in society and civic investment in kind of the goods of society and collective goods. It might also be seen as a precursor to modern humanism as it began shifting the locus of moral responsibility from the church to the community or state. But unlike Renaissance humanism, it was more of an actual ideology than simply a movement toward the revival of classical texts and education. And unlike modern humanism, it was more of a political philosophy than a moral one. Check out our previous video on Renaissance humanism if you're interested in that video, in that view, and stay tuned for a future video on modern humanism if you're interested in kind of the modern equivalent of what we call humanism today. But with that, let's get started. So before learning more about civic humanism, we need to explain a closely related position, classical republicanism. Note that this position is distinct from quote unquote big R republicanism, the US political party. Classical republicanism has its roots in Roman republicanism, which was a rejection of imperial Rome espoused by Cicero and Sallust. Roman Republicans advocated for participatory government and a publicly spirited citizenry who valued the public good over their own private benefits, as opposed to an imperial state run by an emperor. These thinkers claimed that the fall of the Republic was due to people caring more for their own well-being than for the well-being of the Republic as a whole. Some authors refer to the movement in Renaissance Italy, which revived some of these ideas as classical republicanism. These authors claim that this concept of classical republicanism is synonymous with civic humanism. Other authors argue that civic humanism is a historiographical construct, that it was a title retroactively placed on thinkers who share some sympathies with Roman republicanism, but are not truly republicans. In this video, we'll take a little bit of a look at both of these sides of the argument, as well as clearly define what we mean by classical republicanism as well as civic humanism. So. First, we'll look at how civic humanism is defined when it is connected explicitly with classical republicanism. Classical republicanism is most closely associated with Machiavelli and James Harrington. While drawn from the writings of Roman republicans, classical republicanism can also be seen as a rejection of two ideologies which dominated medieval times, the authoritarian rule of kings and the church's monopoly on the way to live an ethical life. Machiavelli often gets a bad rap due to his infamous work, The Prince, which advised rulers on how to gain and maintain power over the people. However, he also wrote Discourses on Living, which many have argued represents his true view of the way a government should function. He argued in this for self-government, quote unquote, that people should act in a way that helps the society at large, not for fear of punishment, but because it is moral and will benefit the whole. You should act morally in this sense, this civic morality, because you're benefiting your community, not because you're following kind of the dictates of a biblical text or the church. And active citizenship and engagement in the political process. He argued that citizens should have a say in government, but also value preserving the republic, their state, over their own personal gain. This pushed against medieval ideas that virtue constituted abdicating personal gain to follow religious laws, not doing so to support a good participatory government. Harrington argued for a type of democracy where power was split between elected representatives portraying an utopian England under such a system in the Commonwealth of Oceania. 
The basic idea for classical Republicans was that the people should be involved in the rule of the state, thereby limiting the powers of any one branch of government and leading to people acting in the interest of the collective, not the individual, to support the Republic. For those who think that civic humanism is nothing more than classical republicanism, the story stops there. They say if you're talking about civic humanism, you're talking about this rebirth of the idea that governments should have many parts that are collectively vying for power so the collective good is maintained, as well as people should have kind of this civic investment in the government and they should act morally, not because they're necessarily because they're being told so by a biblical text, but because it is the just way to act to better their society. However, there are those who argue that there is more nuance to be found in these positions. In order to trace this intuition, we need to return to the individuals most associated with the term. Hans Baron, a 20th century German historian, though Eugene O'Garen also made similar claims. So let's look at how Barron defined civic humanism. The so-called Barron thesis basically states that civic humanism was a movement associated specifically with Florentine Renaissance thinkers, which led to a shift away from ideals of strict class hierarchy and religious censorship towards civic virtue and participation in governance. That sounds very similar to the classical republicanism we were just talking about. Some civic humanisms fit the Barron model mold nicely, such as Leonardo Bruni, who defended the checks and balances of the classical Republican Florentine government as a way to prevent the oppression of tyrants, as well as preventing kind of mob rule. However, others identified with the tradition of civic humanism seemed to be far more open to other forms of government than kind of a strict democracy, weakening the claim that civic humanism can be completely identified with classical republicanism. Coluccio Salatati, apologies for mispronunciations, for example, claimed that tyrants who rose to power legitimately should not be removed by force, no matter how authoritarian their rule. However, tyrants who rose to power illegitimately could be assassinated completely morally, as they had subverted the will of the people and the republic. For Salutati, the case was that even if a ruler was horrible, if they followed kind of the rule of law to be elected, the people didn't have a right to overturn them. However, if someone gained power through a coup, they the people did have a right to overturn them, regardless of their individual policies, because they had broken the framework itself and stepped outside of that. They had broken kind of the broad republic that was trying to harness the will of the people. So once again, kind of walking that line, maybe a push towards slightly more democratic or more Republican, classical Republican views, but not necessarily saying that all dictators have to go. Another thinker that bucks the trend of civic humanists being identified as classical Republicans even more was Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini. Piccolomini argued that while many individual kings of separate nations created conflict, the solution was not to further distribute power, but rather to unite all the nations under one ruler, a new Holy Roman Empire. Once again, attempting to promote harmony and prevent conflict, but doing so in a way that was antithetical to classical republicanism. So some of the beliefs and some level of crossover, but a civic humanist who fit a very different mold. This strain of anti-republicanism can be seen in the writings of others identified as civic humanists, including Machiavelli's The Prince, of course, as well as Aurelio Lippo Brandolini. Brandolini was interested in improving good governance, but defended kingship as a more effective method of government than republicanism for achieving harmony and preventing class conflict. So the moral of the story here is that there were those who were identified as civic humanists who didn't necessarily perfectly align with what we might consider classical republicanism. Now, one might take some of these arguments with a grain of salt, as many of these authors had political or religious affiliations which may have influenced their writing. 
Some argue that Machiavelli's The Prince was written just to get back into the position of power within the Florentine government. Brandolini's work supporting kings may have just been a work of flattery from ki for King Matthias, who was featured in the work. And Piccolomini had some strong reasons for arguing for the resurrection of a Holy Roman Empire. Why? Because he's more commonly known as Pope Pius II. Regardless of how true to Republican ideas classical humanism was, the legacy of these thinkers eventually did lead to the rise of a more secular morality based in civic and communal duty and more participatory government of engaged citizens. This was a movement that eventually broke the church's stranglehold on kind of the right to define what was moral and what was good, and it broke the kind of, along with other philosophers of the time, the power of kings to say that they were the only ones that could rule and that the citizens had no right to participate in good governance of a society. What do you think? Is classical republicanism a good form of government? Was it a move away from the religious asceticism of the Middle Ages a good thing, or should we go back to it? Give me your answers in the comments below. Subscribe if you like this content and you want to see more. Hit that notification bell so you stay updated. Like I said, we have one other video in kind of our mini-series on humanism here. It's going to be on modern humanism, so make sure you hit the notification bell so you can be updated when that video goes out. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.